Hi everyone, my name is Gabe Tandy. In this video, I'm going to be doing a breakdown of this environment that I made inside of Unreal Engine 5 titled The Sierra Nevadas. Building off of my last video, in this one we're going to go over the main aspects of this environment, such as creating the terrain using a combination of satellite data and procedural techniques, set dressing our environment with custom made assets as well as ready made pixel assets, and lastly lighting our environment using an image texture and the sky atmosphere. Now, before diving deeper into this environment, I want to briefly cover the software that I used to create this. I used Unreal Engine, Gaia, Blender, including the OpenGIS plugin, as well as the Grove 3D, and lastly, DaVinci Resolve. Now the idea for this environment initially came when I was perusing Google Earth and I came across this HDRI. From this HDRI, I was able to locate a key location called Flora Mountain. From there, using the OpenGIS plugin inside of Blender, I was able to search up Flora Mountain and zoom into the location. From there, I could zoom out, center on the exact location, and capture the color information from this environment, and then I was able to grab the height information as well. Once I exported my terrain from Blender, I brought it into Unreal Engine. Once inside of Unreal, I flew around the landscape and found a composition that I liked. Next thing I did was I brought in a plane and applied a very simple water material to it. This plane is going to act as my lake. After my lake has been established, I'm going to go into Gaia and generate my background mountains. Here is the terrain that I made inside of Gaia. Because I want to keep this tutorial a little bit shorter, I'm not going to be going in depth on how to create this terrain. Instead, I'm going to give a high level overview and I'm going to make the project file for this terrain available to download in the description of this video. This terrain is based off of my initial reference from Google Earth. So I know I need tall mountains on either side and in between the two, I need a body of water. This could be a lake or in my case, I chose a river. From there, I used several erosion techniques to cut away pieces of the mountain and add detail. My albedo was then created using two sat maps. One sat map had high frequency details and the other sat map had low frequency details. I then combined these two to get the best of both worlds. I did that for my rock as well as for my grass. After that, I then combined my rock and grass textures using procedural masks that included a combination of slope and height information. After I had my final albedo texture, I exported that along with several masks and the height information of the terrain. After all my maps have been exported, I then went into Blender and added a plane. I then scaled the plane up a thousand times and added a displace modifier. I then subdivided the plane to around half a million triangles and applied the height map from Gaia into the displace modifier. The last thing I did was change the mapping type from repeat to extend. And now my terrain is ready to export and bring into Unreal. Once my terrain is imported into Unreal Engine, I use the plane cut modeling tool to cut away the bottom parts of my terrain, leaving only the mountains. And using the plane cut modeling tool again, I can also cut away the bottom part of the satellite information, leaving my foreground to be satellite data and my background to be the procedural Gaia Mountains. Once the mounds are in place, it's time to create their material. Similarly to the Gaia terrain, this master material will be available in the description down below. And because of that, I'm not going to go into depth of this material, but rather give a high level overview of how it functions. For starters, I am using two rock textures and one grass texture. I'm using those two rock textures to texture the slope of my terrain. I'm combining both of them together using a noise mask from Unreal just to get some breakup and avoid noticeable tiling. Next, I lerp between my combined rock textures and my grass texture using the slope and height mask that I exported from Gaia. After that, it's just a matter of blending my procedural textures with my color texture that I exported from Gaia using a lerp and a constant and blending between the two. Once we have the material for our mountains all done, it's time to go over our mountains and add rocks. 
The material that we made only gets us so far, and in order to add that extra detail and photorealism, we need to add 3D geometry. For this, I used Quixel rocks jammed into the side of the mountain, focusing on areas where I knew the rocks would catch light and cast shadow, creating extra details on my mountains. Again, I did not put 3D rocks all over my mountains, only in areas where there was light and they could add detail. Pivoting away from working on my background mountains, I'm going to turn my focus to my foreground. Before I do any set dressing, I have some reference images taken in the Sierra Nevadas that I'm going to base my set dressing around. Looking at these reference images, I can notice three major things. Firstly, there are large granite slabs scattered throughout the entire environment. These large granite slabs, along with the trees, make up our large elements. Secondly, from these large granite slabs, there are smaller granite boulders and rocks that have fallen off of these granite slabs and rolled down to the ground beside them. And thirdly, there are even smaller granite rocks and granite pebbles that are being held in place with pine needles, pine cones, sticks, and grass. Taking into account all of these three elements, it gives me a pretty good idea of how I should go about my set dressing. I need to focus on large shapes consisting of granite slabs and trees. I need to focus on medium shapes consisting of granite boulders and scattered tree debris. And thirdly, I need to focus on small details, including small granite pebbles, grasses, pine needles, pine cones, and sticks. In addition to my set dressing, I'm going to also employ the use of decals to add color breakup and increase the cohesion among the assets. I'm also going to use a decal, scaled up very large, to use in my background to act as the beach separating my mountains from the lake. The next thing I did was to create my trees. I did this by using the Growth 3D add-on inside of Blender. The first process in making trees using the Growth 3D is to build twigs. Now you can go onto the website and buy twigs, or you can create them. In my case, I chose to create my own twigs using Quixel atlases. Once I had made an end, side, upward, and dead twig, it was time to start growing my tree. I added a new grove and selected the Ponderosa tree preset. From there, it was just a matter of growing the tree until it hit my desired height. Once the tree was fully grown, I could then select my twigs and add them to my tree. Now that all the twigs were added, I simply made all the twig instances real and joined them together. Then I joined all the twigs with the tree trunk and exported that over to Unreal. After my tree models were imported into Unreal, I went about setting up a simple bark material and a simple needle material for these trees. I then also made a duplicate of the needle material and made a dead version of the tree. I then went about scattering my trees onto the terrain using the same technique that I outlined in my previous video. I added in a little bit of height variation and went through with a paintbrush and painted in my trees. My first pass was all green trees. After that, I went in and painted some more detailed strokes using the dead trees. These dead trees helped to tell a story with my forest, whether there was a small fire that came through or a type of bug that brought a disease, these dead trees made the scene more interesting, not only due to the color breakup, but also the story they tell. Before moving on from the forest, I made sure to add some rocks and some scree throughout the forest to add more detail and to make the environment look more realistic. It's pretty rare in this type of environment that you see a forest completely undisturbed from rocks and landslides. The last major step in building this environment is nailing down our lighting. My main light source came from my directional light. I increased my directional light intensity to a value of 50 lux to create that harsh mountain lighting. I then went into my sky atmosphere and changed the Raleigh scattering scale to a value of 0 0.01. This makes the sky a much deeper blue color and something that is indicative of high altitude mountain ranges. As you can see with the default value, this sky is much too pale. It's more indicative of a terrain being closer to sea level. For the background sky, I am simply using a massive plane with an image texture. The material is as follows. 
the image texture is plugged into the Quixel Megascan's albedo control setup. That is then plugged into a multiply and a constant, which allows me to control the emissive intensity, and my material is set to unlit and two-sided. These big warbly orbs in the sky are actually serving as my shadow casters. If I was to have a background texture with clouds, but with no shadows on my train, it would look incorrect. So I'm using these big things to cast shadows. As far as my post-process settings go, they are the exact same settings as from my last video. However, one thing that has changed is I have enabled Reference Atmosphere. Reference Atmosphere has to be enabled if you are to see the volumetrics generated by the sky atmosphere. If you do not have the Reference Atmosphere checked, you will not be able to see any of the volumetrics generated by the sky atmosphere. Also, like how I did in the last video, I am again using the Movie Render queue to render out my frames. However, this time I'm using the addition of a console variable, which is r.raytracing.geometry.instance.static.meshes.colling with a value of zero. Now, this is the same console variable I used in the last video, but this time around I ran into some foliage popping issues that were only resolved when I put this console variable into the movie render queue. After the frames had been rendered, I brought them into DaVinci Resolve for some color grading. I simply made some adjustments to my exposure, some slight changes to the hue, I added some blur around the corners of the frame, and added in a little bit of chromatic aberration to finish everything off.